With the 2019 NBA draft finally done and many trades being completed, there have been a lot of changes in the NBA landscape. Here are my winners and losers of this year's 2019 NBA draft. And if you enjoy these types of videos, let's aim for 2,000 likes for the next video tomorrow. And without further ado, let's roll the intro. My winners. Number one, the Atlanta Hawks. They made a trade with the New Orleans Pelicans to get the fourth overall pick in exchange for the number eight overall pick, the number 17th overall pick, and the number 35 overall pick. They drafted DeAndre Hunter at four, which I predicted in my mock draft, and they also got Cam Reddish. I did not expect Reddish to fall to number 10, but I did expect him to be drafted by the Atlanta Hawks either way, with their original number eight pick. And if you rewind in that video, I am very high on Cam Reddish. Atlanta gets a rookie with one of the highest floors of anyone in this year's draft in DeAndre Hunter, as he has the potential to be a great play in the league on both offense, but especially on the defensive end. And that's what the Hawks really needed, as they have Trey Young, Kevin Herter, and John Collins, who are all great offensive players, especially Trey Young and Herter. Then, as a bonus, they also got Cam Reddish, who once again has the potential to be a great offensive talent and also a great defensive talent as well. But because they drafted Hunter, drafting Cam Reddish doesn't seem like a fail if he does become a bust anyway, because you have Hunter. So you may as well take a risk on a guy that was seen as a top three pick only just a few years ago as he was one of the stars of his draft class in high school. Getting both Hunter and Reddish, not to mention they also drafted Bruno Fernando at pick 34, which is, to me, insane. That is a great pick at number 34. Only last year I thought he'd be a top 20 pick in this year's NBA draft. He already has an NBA ready-made body, kind of like when DeAndre Ayton was entering the league. We could tell he was a man amongst boys. And Fernando has that similar type of build. He averaged almost 14 points, 10.5 rebounds, and 2 blocks in 30 minutes per game. So Hunter, Reddish, and Fernando to pair with Trey Young, Kevin Herter, and John Collins? The Atlanta Hawks may have one of the best young cores in the NBA, and they may have done the best in this year's NBA draft, in my opinion. Number 2, the New Orleans Pelicans. Not only did they win by drafting Zion Williamson alone, it wasn't just the Zion Williamson pick that made them winners in this year's NBA draft. Obviously, this was a great moment for the Pelicans, as they now have another franchise player to build around. But we basically all knew this since the NBA lottery. We knew he'd go number one, we knew he'd go to the Pelicans, so why else were they winners in this year's NBA draft? Well, to figure this out, we have to go way back. David Griffin, since taking over, has done some incredible moves that I think have gone a little bit under the radar. They started off this draft with just the first overall pick and the fourth overall pick. They obviously drafted Zion Williamson, which was something that everybody knew, but the Pelicans flipped that fourth overall pick and Solomon Hill's expiring contract and the 57th overall pick to the Atlanta Hawks for the 8th, the 17th, and the 35th pick in this year's NBA draft. In other words, they traded DeAndre Hunter, Solomon Hill, and his huge contract, and a second round pick for Jackson Hayes, which on the defensive side is an incredible player and has a similar defensive capability to what Anthony Davis brought to the Pelicans as a top pick. Now, I'm not saying that Jackson Hayes is Anthony Davis or anything close to Anthony Davis. All I'm saying is on the defensive end, when you watch him, he has the athletic ability and just defensively is a really talented player. Not to mention the Pelicans were in need of a center and they drafted arguably the best center in this year's NBA draft and a guy with a lot of potential. In addition to Hayes, they also got Nikhil Alexander-Walker, which if you watch my mock draft video, I thought he'd be a lottery pick and fall to number 14 to the Boston Celtics. So obviously I rate him highly. He's Shea Gilgis Alexander's cousin. He plays a little bit like Shea Gilgis Alexander and he would be a great player to come off the bench. Considering they got rid of the contract of Solomon Hill, that leaves the New Orleans Pelicans with $30 million in cap space, which is enough to sign a free agent at good money. So they managed to turn Anthony Davis into Lonzo Ball, Brandon Ingram, Josh Hart, Jackson Hayes, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, the 35th overall pick, which they selected Marcos Luzada Silva, a guy from Brazil. They also get LA's 2021st pick if it falls in the top eight, LA's 2022nd pick if it doesn't. They have a chance to swap with the LA Lakers in 2023, and they also get LA's pick in 2024 
or 2025. In addition, they managed to get rid of Solomon Hill's huge contract. Then to top it all off, just throw in Zion Williamson, who was not a part of the Anthony Davis trade, but helped show what the Pelicans have acquired, which is just insane. The Pelicans are now set up for both the short term and the long term. And it's just remarkable how things have changed for the New Orleans Pelicans in just the span of a few months. Regardless of what you think of the rest of the moves that they made, Zion's arrival simply means that this night was a massive night for them and they are winners anyway. Number three, the Denver Nuggets. The Miami Heat drafted Bol Bol at pick 44 and then traded him to the Nuggets. As a Heat fan, this absolutely killed me because if this pays off, they have the two potential top five picks that fell in Michael Porter Jr. and now Bol Bol. Bol Bol is obviously a guy that has many injuries and there are many concerns about how he'll fare in the NBA along with his injury and his motivation, but you cannot deny his talent on the court. Despite suffering an injury early on in his college career, he definitely showed what he could be and put up some incredible ability on full display while dunking, shooting, defending, and showed a lot of potential as a whole. Bobo reportedly slipped as teams just had concerns about his medicals. The five-star recruit missed the end of the 2018-19 season with an injury, but the thing is, despite his injury, Denver has a history of drafting players, having them have a red shirt in their first year, just as they did with Michael Porter Jr., and now he's going to come back to the league healthy, and before he was injured, had the potential to be a top three pick in last year's NBA draft. They're just going to try and reproduce that with Bol Bol. And to me, if this works out, this could be a huge win for the Denver Nuggets. And I guess we all just have to wait and find out. Ultimately, the Nuggets entered this night without a draft pick. And they left with a prospect that many considered a top 10 pick only a year ago. Bobo was a green room invite who fell all the way into the middle of the second round, where the Nuggets traded for him at 44. How sway. Number 4, the Cleveland Cavaliers. Sometimes with a team like the Cleveland Cavaliers, it's best to draft the best player available rather than a guy who's best fit for the team when he may not be that franchise player that you're looking for. And that is why they went for Garland. Ultimately, the Cavaliers ended up going with the best player available in Darius Garland, a freshman whose season ended early as he tore his meniscus this season, which made him a mystery man in this year's NBA draft. I don't know about the pairing of Garland and Sexton, but what I do know is that Garland has a lot of potential, and if they can figure it out, a lot of people are saying it could be like the new Damian Lillard and CJ McCollum. I'm not sure about that, but what I will say is, I believe if you're the Cleveland Cavaliers, you had to draft the best player available, and that is what they did. But that is not the only reason why they were winners in this year's NBA draft. They became winners when they drafted a steal, in my opinion, and a guy who I did not think would fall to this pick and this late in the first round, and that was KPJ, Kevin Porter Jr. The Cleveland Cavaliers packaged four second round picks, along with cash considerations to the Detroit Pistons, to get the 30th overall pick and select a shooting guard in Kevin Porter Jr which in my opinion is an absolute steal. And the reason he fell was due to his so-called immaturity, but if it wasn't for that, his offensive skill set would have made him top 10 to top 15 pick in my opinion. If he figures it out, the Cleveland Cavaliers could have a legitimate scoring threat within a few seasons alongside Garland and another first round pick in Dylan Winder who showed potential as a 6 foot 8 forward and a guy who averaged 21.5 points per game while shooting 67% inside the arc and 43% from beyond the arc. He is a guy that is worth taking a risk on and the Cavaliers' future looks very promising. Not to mention they still have Kevin Love, which they can trade away to a contender for even more young assets. Now, these are my losers. Honestly, there weren't many losers in this year's NBA draft. I have a few teams here, but for the most part, most of the teams in this year's draft got what they needed, and there actually wasn't any surprising letdowns, apart from one team, and that was the Phoenix Suns. The biggest loser that I have is the Phoenix Suns. Cameron Johnson is who the Suns picked at number 11, when they literally had the 6th overall pick and had a chance to draft a point guard, and that point guard would have been Kobe White, which even if they didn't want White paired up with Devin Booker, he is still a point guard that they could have tried out, and a point guard that the Suns desperately need. I have no idea what the Suns were thinking to reach for Cameron Johnson with the 11th overall pick, and they added Dario Saric a year before he hits restricted free agency. Literally, what the actual f**k? Even Cameron Johnson's teammate, Kobe White, was surprised.
Cameron Johnson just went uh, 11th. How do you react to that news? He went what? 11th. <laughs> Cam Johnson the 11th. Yep. It's right on the screen right there. Wow. Wow. Wow, bro. That's crazy. That's so love, bro. Because y'all, if y'all know Cam, you don't know how hard Cam worked. Wow. I'm just, bro, it's such a... That's crazy, bro. Like, he proved it night in, night out that he deserves to be, you know, in the conversation for a lottery pick, man. Wow, bro. That's great. I'm getting chills up here. <laughs> okay, maybe he was more surprised that he got drafted and was really happy for him, but surely a little bit of that reaction was his surprise that he got picked this early, when he was projected to go in the 20s. Cameron Johnson has had some health issues as well. He's been injured in every season that he's played in. He's had surgeries on both hips. He's a guy that could have been drafted around the 15 to 20 range. And instead of drafting a point guard, they drafted a small forward when they really needed a point guard. Literally, all they acquired from trading the sixth pick for the 11th pick was Dario Saric. That is not worth it in my opinion. And in fact, they got robbed. I feel like the Suns could have traded down in the draft even further than pick 11, still drafted Cameron Johnson, the man that they wanted apparently, and they could have gotten an even better player or a future first round pick or future first round picks in general instead of Dario Saric. Okay, now maybe that's a bit far, but on the positive side, what they could do and maybe their reasoning for drafting Cameron Johnson is maybe they know that they can get a good point guard in this year's free agency. I don't know, but D'Angelo Russell seems like a guy that could be on the Phoenix Suns next season. There's been a lot of rumors and speculation, and many people have come out and literally stated that he will play there next season. But at the same time, there's also been speculation and a lot of people denying this claim, but I just don't believe either claims. I believe there's a 100% fact that Russell does not know what he's doing next season, because I feel like his decision will just fall on the decision of Kyrie Irving in the end. In saying that, what Cameron Johnson is good at is his scoring. And he's arguably the best shooter in this year's NBA draft. So pairing him alongside Devin Booker and DeAndre Aiden isn't a bad fit, but it's just not who I would have taken. The next loser is Chris Dunn. Whilst the Bulls were winners in this NBA draft, Chris Dunn was definitely a loser. With the Chicago Bulls taking Kobe White, that obviously isn't a good sign for the current point guard of the Chicago Bulls. He was a top 5 pick in 2016 and he's already on his second team after being drafted by the Timberwolves. He's yet to show any sign of consistency and now that he's been replaced and most likely going to be the backup point guard, once again it just doesn't seem good. Why it seems like the guy for the future for the Chicago Bulls to pair up alongside Zach Levine, Wendell Carter Jr and Larry Markkinen. Dunn may be on the outside looking in now and he may be traded in the near future. Lastly, the last loser that I have is my own team, the Miami Heat. Now, it's not who they drafted. I actually really like who they drafted. I think Tyler Hero will be a decent player in this team. He won't do anything special for us, I don't think, but he seems like a guy that will help us out. We obviously need scoring and shooting, and that's what he provides us. But literally, that bowl bowl pick. Why not keep him for the team, just for a year, let him rehab, and when Hassan Whiteside heads into free agency next season, at least we have bowl bowl on the team so we can see what he can do when he gets healthy. It does not hurt the team at all. Traded him away for literally nothing. Miami got a future second round pick and cash. When literally all we're gonna do is draft another player with that second round pick next year, who I guarantee has a 95% chance to be worse than what Bobo will become. I just don't understand as a Miami Heat fan, why not take the risk? It was your 44th pick, are you serious? Anyway, with that said, if you guys enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like, subscribe if you're new, comment down below your winners and losers of this year's NBA draft, follow me on Instagram, and I'll catch you guys in my next video. I am out. Peace.